Let us bow our heads for prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we have read your word, and may it become a light to our pathways. And may we listen to your word with sincere hearts. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. The prophet Habakkuk announces his complaint about life at the very beginning of his book. And this gives us a situation in which we can understand the world we live in. What Habakkuk says is life isn't fair. Violence prevails, criminals go unpunished, and injustice is the norm. In life, we're surrounded by cruelty, and there's no help in sight. And to make matters worse, it appears God isn't listening. Well, it just happens that Ben Kellert from the Pentecostal Church in Killam has started a prayer tour in various churches in Flagstaff County regarding thefts. Life isn't fair. They're stealing from the churches. I don't know if people think we keep money in church. You know, if they think they can find it. Or if they just plan to be destructive. But churches are being broken into today. Now, I had some experience with that in my previous pastorate in Innisfail. Monday morning, I came to church and found that Sunday night, the church had been broken into. We'd had a huge service. And as it turned out, not all criminals are that intelligent. Even though the service had a huge attendance, a man noticed three young men, strangers to the church. He asked them their names, and they gave them to him. It was those three men that broke into the church that night, and he'd written the names down on a sheet of paper and put them in a drawer. So when I saw Monday morning the church was broken into, I went through all the drawers and found the three names. And I handed them to the RCMP, and they said, we found your criminals. We know who they are. So two of them never came to see me, but one did. And he apologized, said he was sorry. And I said, let's go on a tour of the church. I just want to see what you guys were doing. And I said, by the way, I know where you left the church, in the basement. I know the door. Hey, would you come down to the door? Because I want to show you something. I said, what's that brown stain on the wall? And he looked at me. And I said, I just want to know. I know you guys left through this door because I can see it. But what's that brown stain? He said, one of the guys grabbed the bag of candy you're selling in your church. And we had things like hazelnut cream, and walnut, whatever. It wasn't candy, it was coffee. So when he left the church, he thought it was candy, and he ripped open the bag and just dumped it all into his mouth. He said, what came out is... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's on the wall. I said, I'm fine with that. Do you think God has a sense of humor? He got even, didn't he? With one of you. <laughs> so anyway, this, I worked with this guy in, until uh, uh, I, I went to court, all that sort of stuff. And uh, they assi assigned me as his social worker, or as his a guardian after, after the court case, but he, he got into another fight and, and I never saw him again.
here's Habakkuk's complaint. The outsiders are in deep trouble with their cruelty. And then he says, and it's happening within our own midst. Our own people are like this. We're acting like the outsiders. We're just as bad as they are. So he's, he's complaining about this. And the second part of the reading that Brent read is chapter 2. This is Habakkuk's response. So he goes to the watchtower along the walls and he waits. And he's expecting to hear from God. And he discovers the answer is not instantaneous. The prophet will have to wait. And the answer comes and it's just one line. The righteous live by their faith. That's the answer. That's the line that Paul used when he tried to describe our response to Christ. The righteous live by faith. Paul actually copied from Habakkuk. So it's now a perspective that's been put into life. Violence is everywhere, but I will not be violent. Injustice is everywhere, but I will not be unjust. Cruelty is everywhere, but I will not be cruel. My mind will be formulated by God's perspective. A new perspective is required. And a new perspective will take hold of our lives and it will make a difference. The reason Habakkuk claims it's not instantaneous is because it's a life pattern. It's an alternative to the norm. And amazingly, he claimed it's going to be attractive. It's the good news. And it is effective. So let's turn to this reading from 2 Timothy and see what the just shall live by faith how it's worked out, and how it's incredibly personal and particular. Timothy, Paul says, is a product of a faithful family, although only the women are mentioned. His mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois. Now, we might understand in Timothy's day that life has not been just or righteous, but these women have put their lives into life with a different tune, and it's been effective. It's helped Timothy. Apparently, Paul had conducted a service, a church service, where Paul laid his hands on Timothy and sent him into the ministry. And then Paul's instruction here is, he's telling Timothy, go back to that service that we did when we laid hands on you. Go back to that every once in a while. And rekindle the gift that you received in that service. Life isn't static where a service of ministry solves a problem and then you move on. Life doesn't work that way. Service is like a watchtower and you return to it in order to hear from God. Now, two weeks from now, we're going to have an installation service for Doug Webb as the pastor of this church. The installation service is standard for ministry, but it's not just for Doug. 
It's for the church as well. And out of that comes a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. And we need to remember that these instructions are set in the midst of a culture of Paul's day that is typified by violence, cruelty, and injustice. And Timothy is called to do ministry in the midst of it, not outside of it. So Paul is specific in talking about Timothy, but in another sense, this is not specific to Timothy. He's not unique. The grace that Timothy received to do ministry is the same grace we all receive. Paul states this grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. It appeared in Christ and it's given to us at all times. Now I want to work on this a little bit, but I'll state it boldly here. Scripture is relevant in revealing Christ to us at all times, and that's, that's Paul's point. We read Scripture because it's relevant. Books have been written on this. How can something written 2,000 years ago be relevant? That's an interesting problem. Wait till I get to Jesus talking about slavery. I'll explain my problem with that. But Paul adds more responsibility to all of us and to Timothy. He who saved us and called us with a holy calling according to his own purpose and grace is the one who's here in this service and in this church for this ministry. Then Paul has this rather interesting agenda. It's not according to our works, but according to Christ. And that's our ministry. It's not just a particular leader, Timothy. It's the work of Christ, and it's all part of a developing and growing spirituality. So Paul reminds Timothy that Paul himself is a prisoner. There's the injustice of his world that Paul has experienced. And he says he suffered for the gospel. And there is the cruelty that he has experienced. And yet he comes up with this memorable line, I know whom I have put my trust in. So overall, there's a presence of the Holy Spirit in the ministry of the church to keep the church on track and following the lead of Christ in all it does. Then we come to Jesus and this rather odd teaching from Jesus. There's a prior question regarding this reading this morning. In the reading, the model for discipleship is slavery and that can be difficult for some people. Paul uses the language of slavery and he says you are a slave to somebody. <laughs> You're a slave to Christ or Satan. You're a slave to righteousness or sin. He develops that in Romans 6. A number of years ago I attended a small conference in Manchester in which the speaker expressed disappointment with the Bible. Now, I assumed that was what was going to happen, so I sure made uh, my way to this conference. The speaker was disappointed in the way the Bible says certain ideas. 
And I was sure that possibly this passage would be one of them, where Jesus uses slavery as a model of discipleship. So after I listened to the speaker make the complaint about the scriptures, I suggested God should be eliminated from, from the church too. Because I think God will disappoint you. So if you don't want scripture, why don't you just remove God and we'll just take care of the church ourselves. Well, uh, obviously the speaker didn't appreciate my interpretation. But my position was this, still is, we're intelligent people and we can translate and interp interpret ways of understanding. And though I'm not an advocate of slavery, I need to translate because of it. What the Christian church doesn't have, we don't have Academy Awards for doing ministry. We actually have the Dove Awards for music, but we have no Academy Awards for ministry. And yet we do ministry. We do ministry for children, for youth, for adults, for families, for seniors, for men's, for women's, and we have Bible studies. And there are no Academy Awards for doing any of it. In fact, Paul states instead that he suffers for doing ministry. Yet as servants or slaves of Christ, we do ministry for Christ in his name. Now occasionally, we thank people for doing it. One example, our VBS, we thank the various people to make the summer ministry a success. And we don't give a lot of public thankfulness for all the ministry that's being done. So I'm going to choose one, knowing that I'm going to set it up, and you're going to go, why aren't you doing someone else? But we thank Brent for teaching Sunday school class on Sunday mornings, every Sunday. He gets no Academy Award from the church for it. It just gets done. There's an avalanche of thank yous that we can begin to give, but I'm not going to do it. Here's how Jesus put it. It's rather strong language. When you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. Ugh. It doesn't sound very promising. Are you disappointed with Jesus? I think that speaker in Manchester would have been. Because he couldn't do a translation of it. Now, personally, I do what I do because I find it a joy to be a minister. And it's not a heavy burden. I was called a long time ago, and I occasionally go back to that experience every now and then just to rekindle my enthusiasm for the ministry. And still we live in a world typified by injustice, confusion, and a lack of direction. And we're all called to follow our personal integrity and the church's integrity in the midst of the world. And don't expect the Academy Award. Do it in the name of Christ. Amen.